What stupid things do theists say? And what should we say back to them? From denying evolution to accepting a man in the sky as the reason we're here, stick around and get ready to hear some weird assertions in another Theists Say Stupid Things. Hello, I'm the Skeptic, the British floating circle that watches people make extraordinary claims and then I explain why I don't accept what they're saying. You may even agree with some of those things. Some of the things that theists say are just ridiculous. These are some comments I get on my Facebook page and honestly, I've never been more convinced that what these folks believe is a bit stupid. So I asked for some help in finding short videos that have ridiculous claims from theists and this is what you came up with. Although, before we find out what silly things are said this time, if this isn't your first sceptic video, hit the like, the subscribe and the bell, and more videos like this could show up in your suggested feed. And a super thanks to those that hit super thanks in some recent videos. Banana Slug 1951, Rev Cliff, Andrew Jones 6693, Daniel Hill 7149, and Nuppetball 31. Lisa the Rainbow Giraffe bestows leaves upon you all. More hen. Ready for some silliness? MJacko81 has sent a lot of videos my way for this one. So I started asking congregations, well, why are you guys Christians? And as I asked that question around the country, I got the same three answers. The first and most common response I get for why are you a Christian is, I was raised that way. My parents were Christians. I've been a Christian as long as I can remember. I was raised in the church. Good answer. Is it, though? What if your parents taught you about the wrong God? If Jay Warner Wallace here had grown up in India, perhaps he'd be saying the same thing about the Hindu gods. Or if he grew up in Dubai, he'd be saying the same about Allah. Or if he grew up in Northern Europe in the 9th century, he'd probably be saying the same about Odin. Does where you grow up dictate which is the correct God? The second most popular question, answer is, um, I've had an experience that I can attribute to God. Something happened in my life, either I was cured of something, I was delivered from something, that demonstrated to me that Christianity was true. Good answer. Is it though? Couldn't someone of the Jewish faith have experienced something and attributed it to the more Jewish than Christian God? Couldn't a Scientologist have suddenly experienced something and then decided it was a Thetan or whatever? Couldn't someone from ancient Greece have felt healed by something and believed it was the actions of Zeus? How can you tell the difference between someone experiencing a God versus them just thinking they've experienced a God. The third question is kind of like the second and experiential. I used to be a jerk, and then I met Jesus. I'm not so much a jerk anymore. He transformed my life. Okay, great. Is this more heard about the possibility of Jesus than actually meeting it? Because if folks have really, truly met Jesus they'd be able to show it and tell others where it can be found. If they just think they experienced Jesus, how do they know it was the only white guy in Israel versus, I don't know, maybe Lisa the Rainbow Giraffe, leaf be upon her, touching them on the heart with a giant rainbow hoof? Not one of those reasons demonstrates a God. Sorry. Next. Every pleasure of this life is transient. Solomon, who had a thousand wives and pleasure and power and wealth, summed it up by saying this, vanity, vanity, all is vanity, it's like chasing the wind. Every pleasure is temporal. This world is very superficial, doesn't think very deeply about life and death. What's to think about? When you're alive, you're in life. And when it comes to death, you're no longer here, just as it was before you were born. Why do you need to try and get deep? But we know this world, with all its pleasure, has an end. We're not as those who have no hope, because God's granted us everlasting life. How could you possibly know that? No one has ever come out and said, I'm now living forever because I died and live in a spiritual realm. And you'd have to worship a god for forever too. Because I hardly doubt a god that demands you accept it without it ever proving itself just so you can live for forever is going to let you get on and live forever without constant praise. It may even ask you to work for it because how else is it going to continue making worms that eat babies' eyeballs? Wait a second. Is Ray Comfort going to become a deadly disease factory worker in heaven and be in charge of causing discomfort and worse in babies after he dies no and when we speak of everlasting life we're not speaking of sitting on a cloud playing a rusty harp as some kind of spirit when jesus rose from the dead he rose bodily the disciples thought they'd seen a spirit he said give me some food and when he ate the food the food didn't fall on the floor that's a fun story grandpa i think you've been watching too much casper the friendly ghost also How can you even prove that happened? He was a physical being with feeling and appetite. 
That's the new body we're going to get, a body like under Christ. One that's going to get nailed to a cross because some folks I don't know are going to eat an apple that were told not to. No thanks. You can't play pin the Jew on the cross with me. I'm not even religious. And God's kingdom has come to this earth and God's will will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. I heard as a tis in heaven. Did you know Brits call being mixed up getting in a tizzy or a tis? So really, heaven is in a tis? It's all messed up and there's yet another reason you don't need to believe. Ha! Huh, next. The roadrunner tactic is simply turning a claim on itself. So if someone says there is no truth, you're going to say, is that true? Or if somebody says there are no absolutes, you're going to say, is that an absolute? Or if someone says all truth is relative, you're going to say, is that a relative truth? Or if someone says you can't know anything, you're going to say, then how do you know that? Or if someone says all truth comes from science, you're going to say, does that truth come from science? No, that's a philosophical claim. Or if someone says you ought not judge, then you want to say, then why are you judging me for judging? Because that's a judgment right there. That was a lot, Frank. So what do you say when someone says prove your God exists? Are you going to say, prove it doesn't exist, or you prove it exists? What a stupid tactic to deflect from the bigger question. And no, truth doesn't come from science, but most true things can be verified by scientific methods. So until there's a better way of demonstrating things, I'm sticking with the science. Thanks, Frankie. Next. I think the biggest tragedy is that here in the American church, we've taught you how to read the Bible, but not do the Bible. Really a fundamental of the first century church that needs to become a fundamental of the 21st century church is casting out demons. All believers, all believers can and should cast out demons. Casting out demons? What demons? The only time I've seen anything demon related is when things haven't been going the right way for believers and they need to blame something. Misbehaving kids. I command your mouth to open by the name and authority of Jesus Christ. Huh? Where? YouTube? Mm. She's been watching bad videos. Or stories being made up about a certain pastor that appears in this clip. Three of you in the room right now. You better look in my eyeballs. We ain't afraid of you, you stinking witch. Well, if you're not afraid, call them up on stage and have a conversation with them. Unless you can't, because this entire thing is made up. You devil-worshipping Satanist witch! The fact is, demons, like gods, haven't ever been proven to be real. So how can demons even be cast out, waving your hands manically and shouting, Out, demon! Sure... What you really need to do to protect yourself from demons is to bathe in the urine of Lisa the Rainbow Giraffe Leaf be upon her. Fortunately, all orange soda on the planet is a representation of Lisa P, so just use that. What about the Spider-Man objection to the Gospels, which is the idea that Spider-Man is a fictional figure. And the God and Jesus aren't. But it's placed in a real city such as New York. How do we know Jesus and the Gospels aren't fictional? Because they're also placed in real places. Well, one point to bring to the surface is that there wasn't the kind of careful historical fictional writing in the first century like there is today. So that's important. How do you know that? Are you saying people had no imaginations back then? That's a really silly thing to say. But second, the gospel writers tell us that they're reporting what they saw and heard and investigated. Luke begins his gospel by saying, I have investigated everything Carefully. What I'm about to tell you is true, and it's true because I say so. I once saw a rainbow, and I know that it's because Lisa the Rainbow Giraffe Leafy upon her pooped it into existence. <laughs> Just saying that things are true doesn't make them true. How can we verify what the Bible says? Hint, we don't use the Bible. So if they tell us that, and then we go look at the people and places and archaeological records, and it backs it up, that is one piece of a larger case for the reliability of the New Testament and the Gospel. So the only difference between this and Spider-Man is that you don't think people could imagine up stories back then. Ha! Huh, here's something. What if the Bible is actually made up stories and those folks you insult by saying they can't imagine stuff actually did imagine some stuff? And people went, huh, I like the sound of that. I'm going to treat it as true. People genuinely think that an owl is going to bring them a letter from Hogwarts someday. 
It's the same thing. However old you might be, I bet while exploring the world around you, you've probably wondered how everything came to be. No, not really. And I certainly don't think it's a supernatural wizard's doing. St Thomas Aquinas, a wise thinker from the 13th century, had some interesting ideas about proving the existence of God. Here are his five ways, explained in a way that helps me understand it. Finally, a dumbed-down version I might actually understand. The first way, the domino effect. You know how when you push a row of dominoes, they fall one after another. Well, Aquin has noticed that everything in the world seems to be moving or changing, just like those falling dominoes. Well now, they can accept things changing when it suits them, but when it comes to evolution, they say there are no observable changes. So which is it? But there must be something that started all this motion without being moved itself. Think of it like someone outside the row of dominoes who pushed the first one. Aquin has believed that this first pusher is God. The one who started everything in motion. Okay, but now that claim has been made, you'd have to demonstrate it. You can't just say, someone thinks it was a god, so it must have been a god. Why couldn't that first domino have been something natural? Like a black hole singularity being packed so tightly that it can't sustain itself and it implodes or explodes or something. The second way, the chain of causes. Imagine you have a toy car and you want to make it move. You push it with your hand and it starts moving. But then you wonder what made my hand move. And you realise that it's your muscles and nerves that make your hand move. But even they need something to make them move, like electrical signals from your brain. And this chain of causes can't go on forever. There must be a first cause that set everything else in motion. Aquin has said that first cause is God. That's exactly the same argument as the previous one, just worded different. And what if it was just an infinite chain of events? What if our singularity that caused what we see as our universe wasn't the first one? What if it's just been going and going and going and we're just fortunate enough to have existed and witnessed the bit that we did? When we're gone... Things will probably continue. Stars will collide, implode and explode. Galaxies will collide. The universe or universes will expand and we won't be here to enjoy it or die from it. The third way, the maybe or maybe not game. Have you ever thought about how things exist? Everything you see around you, like trees, animals and even yourself, could either exist or not exist. But imagine if nothing existed at all, then there would be nothing now. So there must be something that has to exist, something that doesn't depend on anything else for its existence. Aquin has called this necessary thing God. Can I call it the universe? Why does it have to be a God? If it was a God, which God is it? There are like 4,000 to choose from. The fourth way, the best of everything. Think about your favourite food or video game. Now, imagine all the versions of that food or game from the worst to the best. Somewhere on that scale, there's something that's the very best right. Aquin has believed that when we look at different things, we can see that some are better than others. And to know what's the best, there must be a perfect standard to compare everything to. Let me guess. That standard is a god. Ha! No. Saying stupid things doesn't make them true. I'm almost sure that something that I find as perfect isn't what someone else finds as perfect. That perfect standard is what we call God. Really? Really? The fifth way, the amazing design. Look at the world around you, the trees, the animals, the stars. They all seem to be so perfectly designed. Just like how a well-made machine works smoothly. Aquin has thought that this incredible design must have come from an intelligent designer. Most of the planet is covered in water, something we need for survival, that we can't even drink. Whales with hip bones that don't need to be there. Ostriches with wings. The recurrent laryngeal nerve in most life is unnecessarily long. But in the giraffe, it's about 20 feet of nerve. Dolphins breathe air, but live in water. None of that is intelligent. You know how when you see a beautiful painting, you know there was an artist who painted it. Well, Aquin has believed that the artist behind the world's design is God. So there you have it. Thomas Aquinas's five ways to prove the existence of God have helped people to understand and appreciate the idea of God's existence. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Thomas just saying that must be a God doesn't mean it actually was a God. That's just Thomas not understanding something and suggesting it was a God. He really needs to prove the God. But it's up to each person to decide what they believe. You could have the absolute best argument or evidence there is in the world to prove God is real. But if the person who receives it is hard in their heart, it won't do much until they soften it. Oh, p- off. Offering wishy-washy, easily explainable answers to all of that and then saying, well, you don't accept it because your heart is too hard is dumb. I don't use my heart to make decisions. I use my brain. 
it's far more reliable. The reason that atheists can't find God, and I say this as a former atheist, is that the way we have been conditioned as a culture is to discover things outwardly. We discover the stars through telescopes, we discover bacteria through microscopes. And that's not wrong, that's a good thing. But it just leaves out this whole other dimension of discovery that we can make. Oh man, you're British, don't let the side down. What other dimension? Rather than turning our attention outwards towards objects, turning that back around our attention towards ourselves and putting our attention on the subject. Who is it that knows these things? It's slightly more difficult in this sense because it's unlike science, um, it's always the same. It's the same observable qualities that someone can replicate the experiment and all the observation and it can be written about and everyone has that shared reality. Whereas when it comes to this form of discovery, it's your own personal journey that you go on um, and that differs from person to person. Hence why it's not so easy to pinpoint this and it goes over some people's heads. Please don't tell me that a god is personal to you because that would mean there are like 8 billion plus gods that all need demonstrating the arrogance of this Brit. Personal gods can't be understood by many. Rude. So what happens when you do turn your attention towards yourself? Well, you can start to analyse and deconstruct yourself and your inner world. You can start to see that your thoughts and your feelings are things that are transient. They come and they go and they change. And actually, if those things are constantly changing, but I'm always there, then that means I can't be those things because I'm always aware of those things changing. So what is it? What is that thing that is aware of those things changing. Someone drank too many lagers. What does this have to do with why atheists can't find a God? I can't be my thoughts and my feelings if they come and go because I'm always here. But you can experience something and know what emotion is behind them. And I'm sure they can be demonstrated with science given levels of chemicals released in your brain holes. And in that line of inquiry, you discover that you are in fact the awareness that is aware of this person, this body, this mind. Um, and when you discover that your awareness, and that's what you truly essentially are, then you can start to analyse, well, if that's essentially what I am, then what qualities do I have? And then you can investigate awareness itself and you can see that I, awareness, am unlimited. I don't have a limit to myself. I, I'm to in, and therefore I'm totally free. I cannot be disturbed. I don't know about that. I think humans have certain limits. You can't imagine yourself flying and then fly. And this is a lot of waffle for why atheists can't find a god. You can't damage or harm awareness. I don't know about that either. Brain trauma might have something to say about that. Um, awareness cannot be, um, because it cannot be disturbed, it's peaceful, inherently peaceful. And that awareness uh, cannot be, uh, have anything added to it or taken away from it. And therefore, it's happy. And you at first make these discoveries on an intellectual level but through meditation and constantly revisiting and going through that path of saying i'm not my thoughts i'm not my feelings i'm this awareness this awareness has these qualities and you keep uh bringing yourself back to that place and reminding yourself of those qualities you then over time slowly um dissolve all of these feelings of separation and being a separate person that suffers those feelings start to fall away and you start to embody these qualities of this peaceful, fulfilled, complete self that not only you are, but everyone is. Did we just sit through all that to suggest that atheists lack awareness and so you can't find a god? That was dumb AF. What if my awareness led me to believe that it was a giant dragon controlling my life? doesn't make any sense. And so there we have another selection of when theists say stupid things. Feel free to message me on other socials with any short videos you find with theists saying stupid things. And maybe they'll make it to the next 
Theists say stupid things. Did any of this convince you? Which of these clips was your least favourite? Let me know in the section below. I'm going to skeptic this as more stupidity dealt with. A big thank you to this month's top level ticks on Patreon. Godless Granny, Addy Rockart, The Enixes, Jakari, Whiskey Tech Fred and the Absolute Lunatic Travis, as well as all the $3 base ticks. You can become a supporter on Patreon too at patreon.com slash the skeptic. The link is in the description, along with links to all my other socials. Don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe if you haven't already. From me, the Skeptic, stay safe, keep thinking logically and ask questions. Skepticism is the first step towards truth. See you next Saturday.